you look nice. Thank you. Just kidding. Uh, this morning we're picking up our series uh, from a couple weeks ago. Last week we had Felix from Western Theological Seminary, and this week we are returning to our series Eating with the Enemy. Um, and as you can see from Miss Tiffany eating a meal with Darth Vader, um, eating a meal with the bad guys can be a bit awkward, a bit uncomfortable, and maybe a little hurtful like it was this week. You look nice. Just kidding. I love it. I love it. Can't get enough of it. Um, so uh, in our series this morning, uh, what we're doing is we're taking a look at a few of the dinners that Jesus was invited to. Um, in the Gospels, Jesus often did dinner with his enemies, um, which is a little weird. And these so-called enemies were not the enemies that the Jewish people of his day would have thought of when they thought of the enemies. In fact, Jesus did dinner with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were like the quintessential good guys in that day. They were righteous. They were law-abiding. Um, they were religious people. They, they were doing all the right things. They were the true religious insiders of their day. And yet Jesus meets with them over meals and then treats these religious insiders, well, like the bad guys, which is interesting. It reminds me, um, a couple years ago, I was headed to church on a Sunday, and I was driving down pole line, headed toward the church. And as I was driving, this thing happened, and it happens a lot here in Idaho, and maybe you've experienced this too, but you're driving, and then another car just decides to turn into your lane going eight miles an hour as you're going 45. Has anyone experienced this? In Idaho, you probably experienced this this morning, I think. Um, anyway, so I'm driving, and this happens, and I slam on my brakes, and I get really frustrated, right? I don't know if you've had this, but you get a little upset. And so I decided I need to show this person how angry I am about what they just did. And so I put my foot down on the pedal and screamed right past them and then kind of turned in front of them and drove past, and I felt like that'll show them. See, I was really angry. Yeah, that's right. And so I continue driving. And as I'm driving, I turn on my left turn signal to turn onto Grandview here. And then I look in my rearview mirror, and that car turns on their left turn signal on to Grandview. And then I turn on my right turn signal to head into the church, and I look, and they do the exact same thing. It's someone from our church. <laughs> and then I felt like a real dum-dum. So I just hid for an hour after that, you know? Didn't come to church that day. Um, but you see, in the Gospels, uh, Jesus shows us that the enemy is not always who you think it is. Um, in his day, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire were the bad guys. Like, if you were a Jewish person, you hated the Roman Empire. They were absolutely the worst, yet Jesus has little to no words to say about the Roman Empire. In fact, there's a moment when Jesus comes face to face with this Roman centurion, who's like this Roman soldier, who's like the definition of the bad guy to the Jews, the Roman soldiers for sure. And Jesus actually compliments him. He compliments the enemy. And then when he is faced with the true Jewish insider, the Pharisee, he treats them like the enemy instead. It's really quite interesting. And so in this series, what we wanted to do is take a look at these dinner party moments that Jesus has with the Pharisees. What was it about the Pharisees in these moments that made them the bad guys? And really, I mean, for us, the question is, like, how do we have to live or act or respond so that we can, you know, not be Jesus' bad guys like the Pharisees were? And that's kind of what we're exploring throughout this series. And so um, this morning, we're going to dive into another one of those dinner moments with the Pharisees. Um, if you have your Bible, our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke. You want to turn there here a second. Luke chapter 11 starting in verse 37. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 37. Um, our scripture reader this morning is Pat Case. Pat, you can head on up when you are ready. In church, what we do here is, if you are able to do at least, is we stand and we face the center of the room as the scripture is read. 
And we do this week after week after week after week after week to remind ourselves that this book matters. It ought to be central to our lives. So, Pat, when you are ready, take it away. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisee, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisee, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load down people, load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some who they will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Thank you, Pat. You all may take a seat after that really encouraging read. Um, if you have your Bibles, I would just stay open there because we're going to be revisiting that passage quite a bit this morning. Um, but um, I want you to, uh, to start, I want to imagine something with you a moment. Um, imagine that you are a faithful Jewish person living in the time of Jesus. And you are from the Galilee, kind of the, the sticks of the area. And the time of year comes for the Passover festival. And there's this big festival. They do it every single year. They call it the Passover festival. And the rules of this Passover festival is that you are to raise up a one-year-old pure lamb. And the lamb is to be sacrificed at the temple, which is in Jerusalem, three days walk away. And you have been selected this year to represent your family. You're going to go to Jerusalem and you are going to offer a sacrifice at the temple. It will be probably the only time in your life that you get a chance to do something like this. So it's a really big deal. You're really, really excited about this moment and you've been meticulous about the planning. You've made sure that the lamb that you're raising is the right age at the right time. It's unblemished. It's a perfect lamb. But you've also made sure that you stay meticulously clean. Because if you go and you find yourself ritually unclean, you're not allowed in the temple. So you've made sure that you are clean. You've made sure the lamb is ready to go. So you begin your three-day journey. It's a long journey to Jerusalem. It's long days. It's hot. And it's tiring. And it's dusty. 
and it's dangerous as you make your way there. But on day three, as you walk, you walk over a ridge line and you see it. You see the city of Jerusalem in the distance. You've arrived. You get really excited at this moment. You're almost finished. The journey's almost over. Very, very soon, you are going to be standing in the temple of God, which is a big deal. You see, you've never been there before, and you're only going to go there this one time to make it to the temple. The temple is God's house. The temple is where God lives. It's on this trip that you will be the nearest to God that you will ever have been in your life and ever since that moment as well. It's a really big deal, and you get excited. You get so excited that you begin to run, and you've got your lamb in tow that we're going to call Tina. You're like, hey, Tina, come on, let's go. We're going to run over, right? And so you're running, and you're running on the path, and you notice as you're running that there's this field that you could cut through, and it would get you into the city quicker. And so you make the judgment, I want to get there. I want to get there as fast as I can. So you start running in the field. Tina, let's go. We're going in the field. And you start running. And as you run, something happens. Your foot catches something, and then you take a tumble to the ground. And then you stand up and you walk over to that spot and then you push back the brush and the dirt to discover that what you just tripped over was a grave. A grave. Now in this moment, as a Jewish person, your heart sinks because you know that as a faithful Jewish person, your contact, even your foot, with a grave makes you ritually unclean and ritually unclean people don't make it to the temple and so you've got to think of a way to get clean again so you can go and do this Passover thing and then you remember see as a kid you memorize the Torah the first five books of the Bible and you remember what Leviticus says Leviticus says that if you want to become clean again you must wait seven days and then there's all these other things you have to do and one of those other things you have to do is you have to shave all the hair on your head. So you shave your head, you shave your beard, you even shave your eyebrows. It all comes off. And then you remember something. See, the Passover festival is only seven days long, which means you won't be clean in time to make it. All this preparation, all this work, all this walking, all of it, and you're going to miss it. You couldn't step foot in the temple. You are unclean. And so, in sadness, you turn around and you go home. Now, that story is not a fiction. That story was fairly common in Jesus' day. If you lived in his day, you knew that story because that happened to people and it happened to him more regularly than we'd like to believe. You see, that story is a story that Jesus is referencing in our passage this morning. If you have your Bibles, um, just turn to our scripture reading a second. I want to show you a couple things. So our scripture goes, there's a Pharisee and this Pharisee's heard about Jesus and um, this Pharisee wants to invite Jesus over for dinner so they can talk and they can discuss and they can debate, do all the things that good Pharisees do. And so the Pharisee and his friends invite Jesus over and they sit down at the table together to eat. And as they sit there, Jesus just tears into his food and starts eating. And the Pharisees notice Jesus didn't wash his hands. And everyone says, gasp, right? That's a really big deal. Um, for a Pharisee, that is a big deal because that violates the law. And so the Pharisees question Jesus and say, hey, dude, like, why didn't you wash your hands? You know, you're supposed to wash before you do these things. We don't just eat, you know, we're not savages. It's not how this works. Some of you parents are like, hey, I've said this to my own kids. I get this. Um, and then Jesus responds as they question him. And Jesus starts to talk and then Jesus' talk turns into a rant. And then Jesus continues to rant, and then rant, and then rant, and then rant. And he just tears into the Pharisees at this moment. He doesn't stop. And then we get to verse 44. If you have your Bible, take a look at verse 44 here a second. Then Jesus, looking across the dinner table to these guys who are just a couple feet away, looks at them in the eye and says this. says, Woe to you, Pharisees. Because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without ever knowing it. Jesus says, you remember the stories we've heard about the people 
that have become ritually unclean and they miss the Passover and how devastating that is? Do you remember that, Pharisee people? Jesus says, yeah, um, you're like those graves. Now, if you ever wondered if Jesus knew how to, like, perform a sick burn, that happened right there. That's pretty impressive, I think. That's quick. I can't imagine actually being on the receiving end of that one. Ouch. Now, there's a lot going on in this passage. But most of this passage is basically a long list of judgments that Jesus casts on these Pharisees and religious rulers. If you have your Bible, take a look in verse 39. 39, Jesus compares the Pharisees to a cup or dish that is clean on the outside but is filthy on the inside. If you scooch down to um, verse 42, verse 42, Jesus critiques the Pharisees tithing while they tithe and they were faithful to the law. They weren't generous at the same time. That's a problem, Jesus says. In verse 43, if you look there, Jesus critiques the Pharisees for loving the important seats and loving, you know, the proper greetings in the public space. They, they valued their status. Status mattered to them. And Jesus wanted them to see, hey, status seems to matter to you. That's a problem for you. In verse 44, Jesus compares the Pharisees to unmarked graves. And then if you keep reading beyond that point, it just keeps going. Critique after critique after critique after critique. And in that moment, if you're sitting on the Pharisees' end of the table, you maybe start to get a little defensive. And that's exactly what happens. Like, hey, when you say this, you're kind of hurting our feelings, Jesus. Could you, like, back it off a little bit? But you see, in this moment... Jesus says critique after critique after critique, and he does so for a reason. He's trying to make one big giant point to the Pharisees. He's trying to get them to actually see something. You see, what Jesus wants the Pharisees at the dinner table to see is that they have mistakenly prioritized the external of their lives over the internal of their lives. Every single one of Jesus' critiques was meant to show how the Pharisees valued their reputation and they valued their image and they valued their status, all the external stuff in their lives over the internal of their lives. The invisible stuff, the stuff that's inside us that we can't quite see. Now what is Jesus talking about when he talks about the inside of us? What does that mean? I think it's one word. Jesus is talking about character. Character. Now, character is the invisible driving force inside of us. Character is that invisible force inside of us that drives us toward all the things that we do and all the things that we choose not to do. It's that thing that motivates our behavior in every sense. Character is the driving force when uh, Star Wars Episode Nine tickets come out and I run and maybe push people out of the way to get to the front of the line to get the tickets. Now that's not good character, but it is character in a sense. Um, character is when someone is in need and another person steps up to the plate and takes care of that need with no strings attached, nothing at all to gain. That reveals someone's character or good character. Um, on Tuesday of this last week, I saw a tremendous character. Um, Cindy Juker had complications from her surgery, so they rushed her back into surgery again. And then Reggie, her husband, who's a vet, was sitting there kind of alone. And then I got to watch as a veteran from the church's veteran group showed up and sat with him, one veteran, and then another veteran, and then another veteran, and another veteran. And they stayed there till one o'clock in the morning until the surgery was done. That's character that reveals our character. And you see, character is the thing that the Pharisees had failed to deal with at the table when they sat with Jesus. Now, to be honest, I think we're not all that different. All too often in our lives, we give priority to the external in our lives, that list of things that we need to do, that checkbox of things that have to happen. And then we forget about or give a lesser priority to the things that are actually inside of us, our character. It doesn't come first. 
You know, just to do an experiment, I want to ask you a question and just think about this in your mind. Just pick a real quick list. But, but what would you say are the top three things you are working toward right now in your life? What are the top three that you're working toward in your life right now? Just think about that a second. Come up with a couple of them. Now, if, if I were to guess... I would guess that for many of us, we won't do a raise of hands, that'd be awkward, um, but I would guess that for many of us, um, finances or money makes that list. I would guess that for many of us, school or our career or retirement or work stuff makes that list. I would guess that marriage and family and kids and all of that stuff makes the list. But what about the internal stuff in us? I mean, when you make a list, what are the things I'm working toward right now? Um, what about uh, learning to love people better? Did, is that up there? Did that make number one slot? Was that, was that on the list of things that we're working toward? Or, or working toward being more peaceful as a person, being at peace even in tremendous difficulty? Or working toward humility? Or working toward being more gracious as a person? Or working toward having greater integrity as a person. Does that, do those things make the list, do they? See, it's often those things, the invisible things inside of us, that we forget. The external, the outside stuff of our lives tends to take priority over the internal, over our character. And you see, the internal in our lives actually matters. Character matters. It's actually a really big deal. Character really matters. It's first order business in our lives. In fact, it could be argued that the number one problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees was not that they didn't follow the rules well enough or whatever it may be. It was that they, they didn't have character at the end of the day. They forgot about all the outsiders and they just made sure to follow their rules and they forgot about what's going on inside of them. It's a character issue that Jesus had problems with. See, our character matters to Jesus. Jesus cares about that. Jesus cares just as much, perhaps even more, about what's going on inside of us than what we do. It's a really big deal to Jesus. It's first order. And you see, there's a reason for that. Um, I love um, the late Billy Graham. He wrote about character at one point, and I love this quote that he has. He says this. He says, When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. Character is a first order issue for Jesus. And it's because there's nothing more damaging in the world than a bad character. Do you want to see damage done? It's through our character every single time. Billy Graham says all is lost. You see, we can do the right things in our lives, and many of us, we try to do them. We try to check all the right boxes, right? We're doing all the right stuff. We tithe, and we go to church, and we try to be positive and likable, and we need to have a friend group, and we get married. We try to do all the right things. We try to have clean language, right? We watch our language, and we try to listen to Christian music because that's the right thing to do. But if our character is bad, even if we check all of those boxes, we will still do serious damage in the world. We still will. Because character matters. Um, if you have your Bible, take a look at verse 46 of our scripture reading a second. Jesus really echoes this in, in verse 46 when he replies to the, uh, the, the experts of the laws. They're like, hey, Jesus, you're kind of hurting our feelings. Could you, you know, back off? And then Jesus is like, no, I'm not backing off. This is what he says. He says, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load down people with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. You see, the Pharisees followed the rules the best that they could in their lives. That was everything to them. They followed the rules. They followed the rules really well, but they were missing something. And that is the internal. They were missing grace along the way for others. And a lack of grace is a lack of character. 
You see, a bad character does great damage in life. And the Pharisees were doing great damage with their bad character while following all the rules the right way. They were still doing damage. We know this character stuff, don't we? You know this. We've all experienced bad character, haven't we? Like we've been on the receiving end of it in our lives. I don't know if you've had this moment, but there's the moment where you're with a friend or someone you trust or whatever it may be. And then suddenly there's a disagreement and you find yourself in an argument with another person, right? And you try to represent like, no, well, this is how I feel about this thing. And then the other person takes that, they misrepresent it, and then they twist it against you, right? Have you ever had a moment like that? And it's really, really frustrating in that moment. When they do that, that's a reflection of their character. That's a character flaw. Or when our spouse betrays us, whatever that might mean. When our spouse hurts us or betrays us or lets us down or whatever it may be, and then we confront our spouse and they say, well, the reason I did that is because of all the things that you did, right? Well, that's a reflection of their character. Um, several weeks ago, the Packers played the Lions. And I'm bitter. And there was bad refing. And then the Packers won because of the bad refing. And then there were a couple of Packer fans in the church that celebrated that win. That's bad character. <laughs> I'm just saying. Pray for me. But we've all been on the receiving end of bad character, haven't we? But what if we turn the tables? Um, what about your character? What about your character and my character? What, what's that looking like these days? It's easy to see and identify the flaws in other people's character. We're really good at that, aren't we? Um, but when we turn the tables, well, then it gets a little hard for us, doesn't it? It's harder to take a look in the mirror at our own character because what we find there is not something that we always want to find, something we're happy with. You know, I guess the question is, um, how do we begin working on it? Like, how do we take a look at the internal that the Pharisees had forgotten about and take a real hard look at it and then begin to take steps to actually do something about that? You see, any time we want to see our character changed or transformed, perhaps is a better word, there is always one simple truth at play. You see, all character transformation always involves a death of a kind and a resurrection of a kind. Anytime we want to change ourselves, our character, we must learn to let the bad parts die in us. And that death is always painful, isn't it? It always hurts when we have to change what's in here. But you see, as bad character dies and a new character comes, um, you could call that a resurrection of sorts. You know, I love the, how the Apostle Paul talks about this. In, in the letter to the Ephesians, he writes about this. It'll be on the screen, but I want to show you a couple of things from this passage. The Apostle Paul writes, and this is what he says. He says, When you heard about Christ and were taught in him, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, to put down your old character, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Again, that's internal work. That's character. To be made new in the attitude of your minds, that's a new character that you're trying to build. And you put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, if there is stuff in you right now that's driving you, the invisible stuff that's a part of us, and that stuff is the kind of stuff that you're not proud of in your life, Paul says, if you want to do something about that, what you do is you let the light who is Jesus to shine on your life and it will reveal it. It will reveal your character. 
And when you can see it then, well then we can take steps to actually do something about it, to put off the old self. And folks, that's always painful. It always hurts. Every single time it feels like death because a part of you really is dying. Several years ago, um, I was in a seminary getting my master's degree. And as I was there, um, I found myself in a class. And while I was in that class, I felt like the light of Christ was shining into my life in ways that I had never experienced before. And I was beginning to see things in my life that I had, I had never really seen before in my life. And I was beginning to see some ugliness in my life that I hadn't seen before, too. One of the things that started coming out was this selfishness that I had had for a really long time in my marriage. I had strung my wife along, made decisions without even asking her, like just pulling her along, um, acting like the leader, never considering her at all, and I nev it never dawned on me that that's how I was living my life. And in that moment in that class, Jesus shed a light on that and said, John, now it's time to deal with it. In that moment, that season was so painful. It was painful because something in me had to die. Now, um, you could ask the church staff. I'm sure I've got some selfishness in there still. You could ask them. Um, but let me tell you, my marriage is not the same because of that. Something had to die. And there was a resurrection and things were at least a little different in that moment. Character transformation always involves death and resurrection. It always does. And you see, it's not like Jesus takes a spotlight and then shines it on us and is like, all right, look at you, ugly. Like, you probably should do something about that. That's not how it works. Jesus shines the spotlight on you and says, hey, it's okay. You can do this death and resurrection thing because I did it first. Just copy me. Do what I did. You can do it. There's a moment where Jesus goes to a cross and he suffers and he dies. And then days later, he is resurrected from the dead, right? And he says, okay, now it's your turn. And it looks like the stuff on the inside that we have to die to often. So we can. You can. What about you right now? Right now is the light of Jesus shining on you. And what do you see? And what's Jesus calling you to do with it? It's going to hurt, but it will be worth it. It always is. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we know that you are here in this space. Right now, you're here. And you are more here than perhaps we are, God. You know what's in our minds. You know, you can see the invisible inside of us, God. And we ask this morning, um, shine the spotlight on us. Show us some of the stuff that needs to die so that we can put on the new self, so that we can experience some resurrection right here, right now. We ask for that. We recognize that it's painful. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you were willing to take that journey first. And so, God, we ask that you help us figure out how to make that journey now too. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord raise his countenance upon you and give you peace, church. Amen.